Welcome to Shared Lunch, a podcast from Sharesies with Business Desk. Now, before we get started, here's some important information. Investing involves risk. You might lose the money you start with. We recommend talking to a licensed financial advisor. We also recommend reading product disclosure documents before deciding to invest. Everything you're about to see and hear is current at the time of recording. Today on the podcast, we talk to Ross Taylor, CEO of Fletcher Building. My name's Francis Cook, Investments Editor for Business Desk. Welcome to the show, Ross. Uh, kia ora. Kia ora. Thanks, Francis. You've been CEO of Fletcher Building for over five years. That is a decent stint. Um, before that, you had other roles. They were focused on construction, engineering, property. So you've been in fairly similar parts of the industry. What attracts you to this sector? I've been in the sector. I've always enjoyed the sector. But what I found is the sector is very broad and you get to work and I've worked up and down what I call the sector value chain. So you can be in it from digging stuff up to then manufacturing products, to distributing those products, to building them. And then uh, at the investment end, when you're raising funds and capital to actually develop and then ownership models. And through my career, I've had the the, the benefit of actually being able to work all through that. And it's very, they're quite different. It's very interesting. And then you add in, moving around the world with it in different companies and so i've never got bored with it and then what i like about that is that it's exciting it excites me it interests me it's my passion but but then you also get to bring expertise to new companies or different different parts of that value chain so i think i'm better able to sort of succeed and make a difference by by building off what i've learned and as long as i'm still passionate and excited about it i don't really have any desire to move too far out of it yeah, well, I've got to say, it's certainly a long way that you've come. I mean, you were raised by a single mum, right? Worked two tough jobs. She was a teacher aide and then also at a bakery in the evenings. Is that correct? And yeah, look. Um, now she, you're at the she, helm of one of our biggest companies. What do you think led to that big factor in, in your success? How do you create uh, such a change in circumstance? Look, I actually think that um, with with my mother, I mean, she was a fabulous role model. You know, single mums do it very tough. And and she did work very hard and uh, really looked out for us and it was a, we had a great childhood I mean it wasn't a negative at all and she created a great environment but you certainly then learn a work ethic I think from that and and you also then as you go to uni and you think well actually I, my mother was doing a lot to invest in myself and my brother and you feel like not an obligation but you don't take that frivolously because you think well okay you you've really invested in us and we don't want to we don't owe you but we certainly want to respect that investment and build off it and you're never really sure how far your career or what your aspirations will take you but but i think she really created um that environment for us and that ethic and and that sense of purpose for want of a better word um she's still with us and you know you know sort of a great relationship with her i mean she's a wonderful lady well i hope she's very proud Oh, I'm sure she would be. I mean, I, I, my, my children and family always say that uh, they don't, don't, don't say a bad word about Ross in front of Nancy, my mother, because she takes a very dim view of that. They, they sort of say I could do almost anything and she'd find a reason why that was okay. <laughs> Bless mums. <laughs> Were there any tough choices along the way to get to where you are? Was there anything you had to sacrifice in order to climb the corporate ladder? Oh, Sacrifice. I mean, I think there's there's always compromise on the. You've always got to. You know, you can't do everything, and there's periods where you're actually balancing a lot of things. And as you have, you know, we have four kids, and we've moved around the world, and and you know there are decisions you have to make with my wife Kathy and the kids. It's, that that yeah, you know, that puts trauma. But I always thought, think of it as a yin and yang. I mean, I you, you want to always be enjoying yourself and doing things you want to do, but but there's no such thing as a just all good. There's always okay, and, and even as we move around the world, an example is that you move the family internationally, and and it's hard at first. You've got to reconnect. The kids have to make friends. We, as a couple, have to make friends, and but then you end up with very rich experiences and very lifelong friends. So, but there's a a rub to it. And but what we always think about is just how do you keep it living and enjoying life and actually having a bit of an adventure. And I think that's sort of the sort of sense of purpose that you keep trying things and you might be a little bit stressed, but it's good stress, not bad stress. So I just think it keeps things vibrant. Um, 
as you go forward. Yeah, it's um, that old thing where I uh, there's a saying that I love that I come back to time and time again, that is you can have anything, but not everything. And it yeah. really is. You have to pick and choose sometimes, don't you? I mean, you're one of three finalists for CEO of the year uh, in the Deloitte Top 200 Awards for 2022. We will find out who wins on December 8th. So good luck to you. Um, but what do you think? got you there and do you think you'll win um personally i'd rather fly below the below the radar for those things i mean i love the the recognition by peers is always nice um what got us here i, th I don't think it's me what got us here is i think you know the journey we've been on with fletcher building and and, and it's been a very public journey and the you know and and we do have the business um performing now but equally, we've got people in Fletcher Building, you know, 15,000 of them. I think actually we see with our engagement that they actually feel the difference in the business. They feel po more positive about the business because what happens in a New Zealand context, particularly with Fletcher Building, is you've got a large staff, but you've also got half the country's either worked in Fletcher Building or has someone they know. So you have all these people with these informed views. And it takes a while, I think, for the sentiment internally externally in the media to turn but you know we've now seen that and i think that progress i've made with the team here is 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 now credible believable and recognized out there and i think that's inevitably what got me the nomination which is nice but it's just so much more than me and that's what that's what makes me a little bit uncomfortable is is but look of all the things i've been in the media for in the last few years i'll take that one <laughs> yeah, you can get a bouquet rather than a brick bat for once. Um, what do you think is an important thing for a CEO to give their team in order to make the team succeed? Yeah, look, there's a few things and a few philosophies I bring into the company in these jobs is that you, you, you do have to lead and you do have to make decisions. But, but when you get into a larger company, you firstly cannot be the center of all decision making and everything because you just glug it up so what you've got to be able to do is to get some of the right people in the right roles but then the key thing is um is they've got to understand where you're going and you've got to engage with them and we've got to come up with a strategy and a set of goals that we all understand and and commit to and there's a bit of that's a bit of work in doing that and it doesn't mean they've got to all take my strategy and my goals we've got to actually collectively come up with the right set so, so, and what that then allows the team to do is to really then uh, successfully implement its stuff without having to bring everything back to me. And so what you see in what you're building around the company now, we've got, if I look at our top leadership team, there's circa about 120 people in it, you know. So I'm quite confident those 120 people that are out in the business, running the business as close to the customers sort of know what we're trying to achieve and they can get on with it without waiting for instructions from me. So I think the key thing you bring is, is that that bought in vision bought in strategy clear understanding and and there's a bunch of other stuff but fundamentally if you get that right then it you know you, you get get you got a half a chance mm. now on a slightly different note do you ever get slightly confused people asking about your batting average <laughs> i think i'm the biggest disappointment in new zealand to be honest because particularly if i'm picked up by uh, any in, any Indian or Pakistani taxi driver because they're so excited that um, they're picking up Ross Taylor, the cricketer, and and one of them had even told me that he thought, oh, he thought, oh, Jim, picking Ross Taylor, he must be up here for his new book release, and he he bought a book along oh. <laughs> taxi cab for me to sign, but then he didn't want me to sign it. He didn't seem to think it was going to do him any good. So <laughs> not so, you. The, the other one. <laughs> I've turned up at a hotel to check in or gotten a taxi and they sort of say, you're not Ross Taylor. I said, but I am, but I'm just not the one you wanted to see. So I just have this pall of disappointment following me around the taxis and hotel rooms of um, New Zealand. <laughs> well, maybe that's the secret um, that we can um, give to other CEOs, that they just need to be, you know, kept, keep their feet on the ground by constantly disappointing people by not being the celebrity <laughs> that they were looking for. <laughs> so company itself it has been a whirlwind time for property and construction and yesterday's ocr announcement of course <laughs> only makes that even more intense so 
let's jump into it. What do you think have been the big changes in the construction market recently? Yeah, well, as you say, it's been a, for not just construction, but all the industry, by the time you had the COVID years, as I call them, and then the the sort of the busyness coming out of them, and then now the overlay of geopolitical risk or wars as well as inflation and that so and then supply chains it, it has been um it's been a lot of challenges um what I, there's probably a couple of ways i talk to us firstly what we're seeing what i call the post covid impacts of supply chain and those sorts of issues are sort of starting to leave us so that's starting to sort itself out so we're seeing that all start to abate and and international supply chains local capacity starting to get itself sorted so that's that's dissipating. If I then look at the busyness of the sector, the, the broader construction, it remains busy, and, and that's fundamentally driven by all that wanted to get built couldn't get built because there weren't enough people, not enough materials. So what you've got is quite a strong backlog of um, work to get through. So that's going to keep the sector busy through to um, at least mid next calendar year, and then what. The overlay is what what is and with all the inflation and or the inflation and then the interest rate response. The debate is what does it look like from mid next year? That that's really so we've got a good bridge of work to get to mid next year, and then it's a matter of what does it look like after that. And you'd have to say that the backdrop is with the interest rates going up, residential particularly will slow. It, you know, it, it's just to what extent. You know, and you, you we, we, we use a lot of economic forecasters to give us advice because it's all too complex, honestly, to try and work out all the different dynamics. And they, there's some, they, they're all expecting it to ease a bit through FY24, basically, or from mid next year onwards. And as I said, no one can really answer to what extent. But the other thing I'd say is that yeah, even though you know the official cash rate's gone up another 75 basis points and they think it'll be a bit further than they thought, it's been flagged for a long time. It's going to go up. So, you know, it is being baked into a lot of the way the banks are lending and what the way people are now purchasing. So so while there's always a lot of commentary around each interest rate rise, it, it is well flagged. And when we're out there selling houses or working in the industry, you know, the people are much more pragmatic. I found with the consumer end of how, whether they should buy a house, not buy a house, and those sorts of decisions because they've thought a lot about it. But uh, yeah. yeah, there has been a lot of talk that buyer demand for new builds, particularly, uh, down on this time last year. Is that what you're seeing as well? Yeah, we've we've found that um, particularly through the um, if we we start the financial year in July, so um, we're actually getting quite good sales volumes for that time of year. It's always slower than anyway, but then we found it really did abate through the August, September uh, months. What we then found is we always builds up again through um, the spring selling season. So and we, we just sell new builds. That's all we do. Um, we've actually, you know, we've been selling a bit less than last year, but not dramatically. So and we're seeing a little, very strong visitations because the precursor to selling a house is how many people are coming through our various developments and they're up above levels that we saw 18 months ago so but the the whole process of buying is taking people longer because you know it's a bit they got to do more work to get the loan if they're selling their own house they um, are, they want to see that happen be they're not taking the risk of oh i'm sure i'll sell it they want to sell it first so so we're seeing good visitation good interest uh, particularly from the first homeowners or those that are moving, have kids and want to just upsize into that mid-market, below mid-market level, which is where most of our product is. Mm -hmm. If I then look into our customer base, where we do a lot of work for the group home builders and other developers, yeah, they're all, as I said, busy really relatively well through to mid next year. But they're, yeah, they're seeing the same sort of dynamics as they sell. So it is pointing to an easing through uh, financial year 24. Well, yeah, and that's what we've seen the Reserve Bank uh, warning about, isn't it? Because, of course, yesterday we saw the official cash rate go up again, um, a fairly shocking 0.75%, and even more so in terms of what the Reserve Bank has been saying, that they're really talking tough. Um, it's looking like maybe the official cash rate could even hit 5% by early next year, which is incredible considering it was 025 18 months ago. Now, like you've mentioned, if people struggle to get finance, then that impacts demand for the building sector. So 
from the people you've talked to, from the forecasts that you look at, what do you think is likely to happen next? And what are you thinking impacts will be? Well, let me break it down. I, I think the um, there's the broader construction sector is roughly 25% what I call non-residential, which is warehouses, data centres, offices, factories, airports, hospitals. Then you end up with what's called what I call infrastructure, which is roads, water, those sort of things is 25% and then 50% is residential. Yeah, so, so so, when you look at the, what I call non-residential, there's very strong pipelines of work around warehousing to support logistics around, there's, there's factories adding capacity, there's work going into, a lot of volume going into the airports developing as a health and education. So there's actually quite a bit of work there and that looks quite solid. So that doesn't look, that looks like it'll be more or less um, at the levels it is for the for the foreseeable future. Roads and infrastructure and water, there's a very well-recognised infrastructure deficit across New Zealand that will grow over the coming years. And it's basically on the back of large committed volumes of projects that we can see already. So then really the question comes, what does residential do? Which is about 50% of the um, the market. And, and, and look, there's a lot of forecasters out there from you know the real bears to the less so but not many people are predicting it's going to go up in volume so it will ease and and uh it'll be somewhere around i don't know the the 10 percentage mark most likely um in volumes um but that it, it just too hard to tell because the reason that it, i'm a bit evasive you've got the cash rates going up with interest rates going up you've got employment's very full you've got a housing deficit people want houses um, and, you know, and, and because the borders are still so clunky and you really can't get labour in, vacancy rates are very high across our industry and everyone. So, and that's actually, you know, keeping a lot of, it will keep employment high for a long time. So, so that dynamic's a bit confusing because quite often you get interest rate cycle, inflation cycle, and you get unemployment going up, but that's not what we're seeing. So I think it's confusing out there. And so we're just basically taking the view, look, it's still busy and we'll stay very focused on it if it starts to ease and uh, cut our cloth accordingly. But right now we're not seeing it in, in our volumes. Yeah, it is a, a weird kind of, um, I mean, it's not technically recession yet, but heading towards recession, it's, it's a weird one. Um, we have seen uh, one bit of bad news that I noted and sort of winced at is the construction industry has had the highest number of insolvencies between July and September. It went up 50% to 107. Um, that's from the BWA insolvency report. I mean, does that worry you? Um, well, if you want to, what you've got to have to, well, firstly, it's not good seeing businesses go insolvent. So that's that's where I'd start with that. Then you look at through other major corrections, uh, what we're seeing now, how do they relate to those? And they're not anywhere near some of those metrics. Then I look into, you know, placemakers, our distribution business works with a lot of small to medium enterprise. And there's been a few, maybe and it has increased. But when you look at the backdrop there, we're seeing very little uh, signs of uh, those sorts of issues playing out uh, broadly across across all those small businesses. I mean, they're all um, being very prudent about how they're running their businesses. And what I mean by that is in the inflation environment, they're not taking fixed prices generally, they're, which isn't good for the consumer because the consumer wears the brunt of that. But they're being very prudent. You know, the inflation dynamic's been around now for 18 months. So they've really got themselves on a setting to be careful about that. Um, so... So I'm not saying there won't be more. There, there will be, but I, right now I'm just not seeing what I call a wholesale escalation of that sort of distress out there. Um, yeah. So that's just based on the data we see, and we do touch a lot of those businesses. You know, we've got about over 50,000 customers we work with across New Zealand, so we do see a fair bit. Yeah, well, fingers crossed that we do see people manage to hold tight there because, like you say, it is awful seeing people's businesses Absolutely. go under. Um, on a more positive note, there are some fascinating new ideas coming up in construction all the time. I mean, I, I just, I think, you know, sustainable housing, 3D printing entire homes, smart homes. I mean, is there anything that you find particularly exciting in the sector at the moment? Oh look, the, it is moving and moving at pace, and um, and and there's no part of the sector that's untouched by it. And to give you, a, you know, what well, just to give you a sense of it, 
and, and why it's moving paces. What's we, we, we've invested overseas in a a fund that invests in startup technology, just so we get access to the ideas that are emerging. And we spend our time going out around the world just to look at what's going on. And we've looked in the last two years about 350 um, startups and their ideas just so we can stay ahead of it. But to give you, then cutting through what, what, what I see is really interesting is, firstly, the decarbonisation trend. It is pervasive. And mm -hmm. forget whether you believe it or don't believe it, 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 it will happen and the building products and the solutions will decarbonise. And so what that means for us is, you know, we've just launched our 30% lower carbon cement than, than anybody else in New Zealand. Our concrete mixes do that. So how we, and that's really, really getting the carbon out of cement. And for those that don't follow it, you know, when you look at the major emis emissions loads around the world, 8% of the carbon in the world is from cement and concrete manufacture. So getting cement decarbonized because it's so pervasive, it's, you know, the most used product in the world is water. The second most used is cement and concrete, just to give wow. you a sense of volumetric wise. So, so getting that decarbonized is really important. So there's lots of technology emerging now. We're well on that path. And I think cement and concrete by about the middle of the 2030s, maybe 2040s, will be probably a carbon sink. I think that's where the it'll actually suck in carbon. But we're seeing the, the carbon trend across all products. We're seeing then how you put products together, really changing thing. We just did a low-co house, and that's how do you do a house that's a low-carbon house that keeps, and it's all about how it operates over its 70, 90-year lifespan. Is really, it's embodied, but what also how it operates. So all the technologies going in there are quite dramatic. And you're seeing codes change and how you make houses more thermally efficient change. You're seeing, you know, it just goes on. Wood's getting re-engineered with, with people that are coming up with woods that are more manufactured woods than grown woods, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just pervasive across the whole value chain. And that's on the decarbonization trend. Then you get into things around automation and digitization. So I start with automation. What's happening is it's getting so good and so cheap that it's a real good thing for developed country manufacturing because it used to be the developing countries had cheaper labor and that was their advantage. Now what's happening is they're using the same automation we use here. So it means we're better able to manufacture in developed countries because we just don't need as many people. And the people that are there are retrained in a much more skilled job. So that's again, another trend we're seeing. And then you've got all things digital and the analytics and the data and the amount of data that's awash in the world now and how you analyze it and the insights you can get uh, just, dramatically escalating, you know, year on year and getting our minds around that is exciting and challenging as well. So it is moving at pace, which makes it really interesting, um, both for an opportunities, but equally, you know, to keep the job interesting. That is fascinating um, because I just a little um, insight here for the Sharesies listeners, you're getting the jump on what's going to be on business desk tomorrow, because I was just going through an IMF report that was looking at the impact of um, carbon emissions on company stock prices. And basically, um, there's a very clear statistical link of heavy carbon em emitters, it does end up hitting their stock price, it sends the stock price lower, those who can um, emit less carbon than their competitors end up more profitable, therefore stock price goes up, there's a very clear link there. So when you're looking at technologies like this to decarbonize, I mean, do you see that as a game changer and a necessary thing for Fletcher building as a business? Yeah, look, I think it's survival. It's as, as I mean, it's, firstly, don't do it and you'll be broadly out of business, I think, in the next five to 10 years. And I don't mean that that's not what's, there's the aspirational side of it too. It's, you know, in terms of what you can do for the, the world's um, in, environment anyway. But but what we're doing is taking the other step. It's a huge competitive advantage. So you generally, what we're finding is you can't really charge for decarbonization. I mean, you've broadly got to be able to do it at or better than the same price point, but it's it, you can do it. The technologies are moving that way broadly. So we, we're we basically making sure we get ahead of the curve relative to the competition, because then if you can do it at a reason, the same, give or take the same price point, then basically 
people will choose to use it over your competitors. Um, so therefore, it becomes a major competitive advantage if you can get ahead of the curve. So we are really leaning into it and want to lead in that. And we've put that that statement out there and I and put you know, our actions and our performance now where our mouth is and we're actually achieving that. Build to rent has been such a buzz phrase. I feel like it came from nobody was talking about this 18 months ago. Now we're all talking about build to rent. Um, are you looking at that market? Is that something you're interested in? Yeah, we're looking at it. We haven't made a decision to get into it or not yet, but it's certainly on our radar and something we'll continue to look at. But um, yeah, we're, we're sort of, yeah. And, and there's two parts to it for us is, is exactly what the returns are. And, but then equally, can we sensibly get enough extra product in our own pipeline to support a, enough scale in that, that part of it? But, but, absolutely looking at it very hard what would make it worth it to you look i think there's there's uh, i hope we do crack it but we've got to make but but there's a couple of components it, it needs to be um a big enough opportunity to because you've got to put all the effort in to stand up a business so if it's just a couple of houses it doesn't make a big difference to us or um the market the other the other so that's one part of it just its returns have to make sense. But then the third part, which makes us really want to look at it, is it's it's got a real nice social outcome for us. You know, because, you know, as a big corporate, you get judged on what you do and don't do um, to support the broader society. And, and by doing the bill to rent, um, I think it gives us a real opportunity to do a bit more than and then just develop houses. Um, and we can actually hopefully provide a product that 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 helps a lot of families across New Zealand as well. So so there's a, a good triumvirate there. So it's why we're having a really good look at it because I think potentially if we can make it work, it's got more than just what I call another business making money. We can hopefully get some, some nice social outcomes with it as well. Yeah, if you got into Build to Rent, would that mean getting back into the sort of the high-rise construction part of the market? Because my impression is that Fletcher Building has pretty much left the high-rise uh, end of the market, it is seen as riskier, right? So a couple of things. Um, we 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 do not do high rise construction through Fletcher Construction. Uh, yeah. we, we we're finishing a building in Auckland, a convention centre, um, but that will be the last one we do in that space. Um, we, but we we already do run an apartments business. Um, so so the, as a developer though, so we've in our in our residential development business, we 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 do. Um, you know, single houses, terraces, and apartments. So, so when we do those apartments, um, we we have the development managers and the skills, but we generally then will work with other contractors to do the building of the apartments. So, as we think of build to rent, we do that as an investor slash developer. Should we do it, um, not as a builder. Um, the other part of the puzzle here is we've also got an offsite manufacturing. A company called Clevercore, which is where we're working out how to build the panels that you then clip together to make houses and apartments with automation and machinery. So as that matures, we're working on terrace houses right now and single houses. But what the idea is, is that we'll mature that over the next couple of years into apartments as well. And that means you'll start to de-risk that. So as that matures, we'll probably think a bit differently about how we potentially put those apartment buildings up, um, assuming we can uh, leverage what we've learned in low low rise housing, offsite manufacturing into high rise. Interesting stuff. All right. Well, I will jump into audience questions now because I've got quite a few and um, they are great questions. We're going to start here with one from Rebecca, who is not pulling her punches. I will tell you that much. As a shareholder in Fletcher Building, who has seen their investment decrease by 25 percent, what confidence can you give me that the current board and management team can deliver future growth and sustained profitability? Or should I just cut my losses and sell my shares? Your thoughts? Yeah, well, I won't give share advice. I'll firstly say to Rebecca that, um, like she has, I, I have a lot of shares in Fletcher Building too, which part of my deal was to buy them when I started. So I think that's good because it aligns me with with shareholders and it goes to the whole executive team. So so we're feeling it. Um, and I mean that very sincerely. What we When we talk to um, our investors, the, the, the big institutions, 
Um, they're very complementary in terms of what we've done with the performance and the position we've got the business in and what we're doing. What they're all saying is their concerns and what's affected Fletcher Building and all of our peers in this sector, both in New Zealand and Australia in this region, is the view on the macro. And what that what I mean by that is that the markets are very concerned where residential's going with the interest rate cycles. And until they get clear on that, they basically get very cautious about investing and some will even sell out because they don't like that macro, not of us particularly, but that sector. So that puts a headwind on our share price. And if you look at us and all the peers in the sector, we've all come off by, we're not as much as others. So some have come off even more dramatically. I'm not making an excuse out of that, but but until that the interest rate cycle becomes clear and the impacts on um, on uh, just where the market goes, I, I think that's going to put a, a pall over any stocks in our sector, um, is my view. When the timing around that and exactly how it looks, um, not sure. What we have to do is run the business well. So what that's about is, you know, we, we, we've we been very explicit in guidance that we think will increase profits next year. We've talked about the growth we're doing. So I'm very confident in our ability to navigate it and to, and to grow the business through it. But I can't then control the share price. That will eventually look after itself, in my view, but it's, it's difficult to predict. A similar follow-up question here from Mohan. What are the specific things Fletcher is doing to increase shareholder value during the next two years? Yeah, so what, what we're focused on is, is a couple of things. So firstly, it's really important to the extent there is a cycle and it gets a bit tighter that we manage ourselves through the cycle very well and we don't give away all the hard fought wins that we've now achieved in in driving our profitability and profits so so what we've said to the market you know if, to give you a sense we finished um the second half of fy22 or second half of last financial year with our margins um up in the eight you know up high and uh, up in the nine percent and what we what we don't want to do is give that away so what we've said is assuming there's a bit of a tightening and we're looking forward we have told the market and our shareholders that we'll we'll keep our margins between nine to ten percent margins through the cycle. So that says that we'll run this business efficiently on the way through. So we'll make won't give up the gains we've made. The second thing we've said we're doing is we're looking at how we, you know, I think you make more gains through a turbulent period than you do through a calm period. So we're actively, we've got our balance sheet in a really good position. So we're actively looking at where how we grow. And we're being very thoughtful about that. We're not growing by adding capacity at the top of a market because that might be a silly thing to do. We're looking at the adjacencies or where we can take turf, for want of a better word, around the business with investments. And we've got a, a program of investments and we've talked about it over 500 million over the next couple of years where we're investing in adjacencies, which we'll do. And we're basing those investments on what I call reduced market volumes that we expect to make sure they work even in those situations. So we've got a good growth platform in our control, which we're well on the way to implementing. And to give you a sense of that, We'll get. We're looking for fifteen percent return on that capital, which means we should add about around a hundred million of profits to the bottom line at least. The third thing we're doing as we then look forward around those things is how do we keep as we make those investments? We want to drive profitability, so we're saying we should be able to add another one to two percent. So once we get through the cycle, we should be able to add more profitability, more profitable profits, for want of a better word, to that. So. So we're working across those themes economically to really um, lift the business performance over the next couple of years. And then beyond that, we're, we're, it's the things we drifted into earlier. We're very focused on you know, our, our customer excellence, the sustainability piece, the environmental piece, and those other things too, because you can't just be on economics. You've got to play to a broader set of issues for society and your own people. So, so that's what gives me a fair bit of confidence um, that we'll, we, we're on the right track and, and we can really touch it and feel it. And, and yeah, so, so confident, but yeah, I've got to wait to see the investment market, see where the market's going, I think, before we'll see any joy. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Changing gears a little bit. Uh, this one from uh, we've just got the letter T. So hello, T. Uh, what are your views on Fletcher having a monopoly over Jib? Is it fair to have so much influence over housing cost and construction, especially at a time of record low home ownership? Yeah, so 
the thing is with the, the plasterboard in in New Zealand, we we only got that position because it cost, there are imports. It's been a lot of myth out there about what goes on, but there are imports and they can be accessed by customers and there's nothing stopping it at all, um, despite some of the more um, hysterical commentary that went on over the last six months. When you look back at what has been Wallboard, Winston Wallboards or Jib's success, um, is there, they've got an amazing customer's, customer service proposition and they've still got to have the price and the value at the right point as well. And it's that customer service that actually has led to that market share um, over the years and its maintenance of it. And just to say, you just don't think that's a very typical CEO sort of answer to that question. When you look around the world, the, the businesses that actually perform best with customers end up with bigger market shares and generally better profits as well, just because they must, they've got to be efficient at what they do. And, and that, and we, we do a thing called um, competitive benchmark uh, customer surveys, which means you don't, you just go out in the market and you just see uh, what everyone's saying about you and your competitors. And Winston Warboards or Jib were, is up above 50, in, which is really high for that sort of thing. It's, all, it's at world-class levels. And, and the rest of the industry is negative. So when you've got that differential in performance to your customers, that's where they win. It's their innovation, it's the customer service, it's the whole package. Um, and therefore I'm very, and the funny thing is if, if it wasn't for our onshore manufacturing and the amount of um, plus what we make here, when all the capacity issues hit the market, you couldn't get imports because everybody else's markets where they were were busy. And that was what caused the squeeze. So the good thing in some respects was there was a bunch of, we were resilient as a country because we had onshore manufacturing. Now we could have done it better. We What we should have done is put an emergency fund in because we just didn't think that through properly and we were late by six months to do that. We could have gone into allocation earlier. So we made some missteps through that. So I don't pretend we handled ourselves perfectly, um, but there are a lot of attributes about what we do in plasterboard. And, and we'll have Tarico, our new plant open in, um, in May, productive and that'll add 30% more capacity. So we'll be be there by then, but already it's eased anyway, and we're meeting meeting demand anyway now. All right, and this might be the last one we have time for. We'll see how we go, but a great question from Anne-Marie. What are your plans with your panelization plant? Started with a hiss and a bang, but yet to hear of anything materializing. Goal was 500 houses. How many have actually been built? Yeah, that was what I was talking off-site manufacturing or clever core. Um, earlier. So our goal is 500 in the first stage. We actually want to scale it to 2000. Um, where it's at now, it's doing about 150, 200 um, is what we expect through this year. Um, what happened was we, you, you start these things and you don't know what you don't know. And I don't mean that you, know, you, you can do the manufacturing piece, but what, what really the challenges start coming is the whole industry is built around building houses in situ out on blocks of land. So all the authority approvals, they go out and look at it as you build and approve it progressively. So suddenly when you're in a factory and you're doing things repetitively, you've got to re-engineer the whole way you talk to authorities. You actually then get out on site and you, you, you find there's custom and practice around what has to be way builders and tradies work. And you've got to re-engineer that. And it just was, I'll admit it, a lot more complex and a lot harder than we thought. That said, we're now three years into it, or two and a half years into it, and we've learned an enormous amount. So we've actually really got very clear pathways now to what I call scale this to the 500. And once we prove that up, that's the last piece of the puzzle, then we'll actually then really invest and take it much bigger and have a much bigger impact on what we're doing ourselves, but equally housing in New Zealand in terms of making it far, because it is, we've proven it's faster. We just got to get the price point down and make sure it's as competitive as we want it to be. Interesting stuff. All right. Well, we are out of time. Thank you so much, everyone, for brilliant questions there and for tuning in. And a big thank you to Ross for joining us as well. Really appreciate your time and your insights. Yep. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening and a big thanks to Ross for joining us. Now, if you're not following the podcast, you can on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a rating and a comment with who and what you'd like to hear about. Why not check out Shared Lunch Live as a Thursday lunchtime webinar via Crowdcast or watch it anytime on the Sharesies YouTube channel. Grab the link in the description of this podcast. 
Next week on Shared Lunch, Felix Fock from Milford Asset Management is back to talk social media stocks. Register for that discussion on Crowdcast. You can hear conversations play out in real time and get your questions answered on air. The link is in our podcast description. Until next time, enjoy the rest of your week. Stay safe.